So the second speaker of this panel and the last for today will be David Strang. I will introduce him briefly. David Strang is a lecturer in music and technology at the School of Humanities and Performing Arts, Faculty of Arts, University of Plymouth. He's also mainly an artist, works with sound and interactive elements. His work looks closely at the natural surrounding we live in and amplifies certain aspects to heighten our perception of space, place, Recent work includes uh, site-specific installation, performance, field recording, networks, appropriating media objects, hacking, and noise. David works across multiple, multiple disciplines, such as architecture, sciences, exploring data to create artistic outputs. As part of his practice, David runs various experimental workshops, exploring aspects of sonic arts, hacking, sensors, in a multi-strand collaborative framework. Uh, these workshops are aimed uh, to at the transfer to, of knowledge throughout the group to create an artwork performance object in a few days. Since 2009, David is developing, do, together with the fellow artist Vincent van Uffen, the multiform collaborative project Transmission Plus Interference. And this same project is the central topic of the paper David is going to present to us today. So thank you. Welcome to David. <laughs> Thank you very much for those kind words, um, and thank you to. Sorry, oh, I've got two now. Thank you. I should be fine. Um, yeah, thanks to everybody at the Art Laboratory Berlin for inviting me to uh, to take part in this, and um, yeah, um, it's a real honour to to uh, be involved in this. Um, it's been a fascinating day. I hope I can close it with something that's quite interesting. Um, and thanks to Birgit for a talk, which kind of covers everything of my project, so I can just be very simple, which is perfect. Um, so um, I want to talk mainly about this project, Transmission and Interference, um, but um, uh, to start with, I just uh, go back about nine years or so just to show a project which shows a kind of um, why I'm interested in this interaction between sound and image, um, and show a piece of work from a series called that I made about nine years ago called TV Hertz. I'll just show a little bit of it. apologize in advance for uh, any noise that you don't like, but uh, that's the way it will be, unfortunately. Um, so yeah, this is uh, my interest in just um, uh, plugging things in the wrong way, um, putting, connecting um, sound devices into the visual inputs of TVs and um, then making kind of uh, very interesting uh, visualizations of this. Um, I, don't th I don't believe I'm a synesthete. Um, I don't th think I have that. Um, it'd be interesting to find out over the next couple of days, but um, uh, I'm just interested in this interaction and it's mainly with the devices and the machines and themselves that I'm um, finding this uh, particularly interesting. Um, so I wanted to just start to talk a little bit about a major part of the, the research um, in the project which is based in um, noise and the potential of noise. Um, it gets a pretty bad name. Um, I really like it and um, it has a great potential for us, um, especially within uh, the practices of, of things like EVP, electronic voice phenomena, which um, are using things like white noise to fill spaces. And this use of white noise is a very interesting one. Um, uh, white noise contains all of the frequencies of sound uh, from the very low to the very high at equal level. Um, so essentially from white noise we can sculpt any sound. We can by doing what's called subtractive synthesis, we can remove 
particular parts and make any other sound out of it. So it has the potential to be any kind of sound. And this is um, explored quite heavily in things like EVP, um, uh, where rooms are filled with white noise and recorded, and then loops of these tapes are listened back to, and suddenly you can hear voices from uh, the past or the, the dead talking to you. Um, this is uh, covered very nicely in the um, Joe Banks book, um, which the name of it escapes me right now. But um, this this idea of of, uh, of noise is not something that's just been around since um, uh, the use of recording technology. Um, in fact, in the 1870s, Banks write, uh, writes about this that. Uh, uh, many people would have uh, rights about um, experiences of, of people's being noted down that uh, a, a particular, uh, I can't remember, a, a particular woman who had a servant, she uh, who had to follow her around banging a drum at every conversation so that she would be able to hear the, the words until the, the banging of that drum, her hearing was at a very low level. So the actual noise is used to increase the sensitivity of her ears and so she can hear the words clearer. People who would have conversations on carriage rides across shingle um, so that there would be like a white noise essentially in the background so that it excites the follicles of the ear. And this is kind of um, being used in uh, sound synthesis um, today in very high technic um, areas um, in the area of uh, stochastic resonance which is um, doing a very, very similar thing of blasting essentially lots and lots of noise to be able to carry a signal, um, which is something which I'm interested in, in terms of uh, the, uh, the basics of this project. And so to the, um, the project itself, um, it's a, um, an ongoing collaborative project with Vincent van Uflen, uh, which we started in about 2008, 2009, took a long gap and then started again in 2012. And it began with this um, hack that we found um, to be able to use the light of a laser pointer. Um, uh, the laser pen with me, but I've got an example of um, a more recent um, edition with me, which I can show, plus I have some examples to show um, from demos and videos that we've made. Um, so once we uh, discovered how we could, that we could actually do this, it's very simple, um, and we don't own this in any way at all, we found this this hack and many people have used it but we didn't see anybody really doing anything interesting apart from how you can make a sound network for your living room or something none of it really seemed to be any use and the audio quality isn't that great for something like this either um, not the way that we did it anyway and maybe it is if you use um, different devices these the different elements and components have a, a big part to play in this as well um, so we were interested in what can we make from this so we have this part where we can we can transmit sound and we can pick it up, but we were interested in this part in between this, that we can interfere with it. And we can start to play with it a little bit more than we would do inside like a computer or something like that. Um, so uh, this, um, this we thought was quite, uh, quite an interesting part that essentially if you just flick the, the, a laser pen across the LDR, um, or across the solar cell, then you just get a pop or a click. And essentially, this is like a kick drum. So we can kind of build elements of music out of these parts of things uh, without having to constantly always use an interesting musical source to start with. And um, so uh, that went quite well. Um, there was some interest in, in what the project was. And um, because we didn't really know what we were doing, and we kind of openly state this in all of our workshops. We have a basic understanding and every time we do another workshop we learn more and more stuff but we're not engineers of any sort um, and we, we're breaking things all the time with it and uh, sometimes for the, for the benefit of the project, sometimes not so much. Um, but um, it's working out um, reasonably well but um, we wanted to get other people involved in it and so we started to run workshops and the first workshop we ran was around the same time as the uh, installation in um, iDesign and we essentially just got people to make exactly what we already knew how to make and that worked quite well but um, there was interest in the project but we weren't really um, creating anything um, particularly special at this point um, and then for a few years we didn't do anything on the project uh, kind of we were a bit annoyed nothing was really kind of working for it and then i was invited to put, to put forward a performance for the contemporary music festival in plymouth for this year took place in February, and uh, this was in 2012, we started to discuss, well, maybe we could make a performance, maybe we could 
actually perform something, um, a noise piece or something like this. And um, uh, this scared the hell out of Vincent, um, not wanting to do anything like that, never performed or any, done any musical kind of thing at all. Um, I'm not much of a performer, I don't really like doing it, but we kind of thought this was maybe, for the project, pretty good. Um, and so we got together and we started to um, play around with these uh, devices a lot more, much more focused, and started to um, get a real understanding, better understanding of the project. Um, one main thing that happened when we started to do this was um, one major mistake we made was we had some laser pens that we'd hacked and they had two buttons, some of them some of them just had one button which was a, like a red, you press it and a red laser comes out. Um, another one set of them that we had had two buttons and one button did a red laser and the other one did an LED and after you start hacking them you kind of lose which one's which and so by accident we press the LED and we blow the speakers because suddenly the, the music comes out extremely loud and we were like wow this is quite that's quite amazing so essentially from all the way across the other end of the room we could project light which contained sound and pick it up very very clearly at the other end uh, we didn't have to be amazingly precise like with a laser and things like this and so we started to use uh, instead of LDRs, the little light-dependent resistors started to use um, more solar cells, which have got a bigger surface area, um, and started to use LEDs and for um, particular parts, as well as using them in combination with the lasers and things like this. So um, we started to get um, a lot more understanding, again, out of breaking things and whatever. Um, and I can play... Um, I've got some stuff here we can, if it, people are interested to hear the parts, we can maybe plug it in at the end or something, but um, I've got some... Um, demos. So in one of the, in the demos you'll hear basically the hum of the electric lights that are, that are on in the room, then you'll hear cl uh, clicks and pops and things like that, that's the laser pen going across, and then I think at some point we've got um, Vincent plays some Bell and Sebastian through, a LED, through an LED and um, hopefully it should work. <laughs> So this is the hum of the, of the light from the room. Um, this is the solar cell on the table there, and this is an LED. But this is it with being played with a um, laser. something from Spotify or something. Being, um, is modulating the, uh, the light far faster than we can see and so it just looks like a constant green light but that is essentially a speaker um, it's making the sound come from the phone and we can then interfere with it and we can get computer fans and things like this and <laughs> pitch the light and um, make uh, more tones and things like this out of rather than just always having to be a constant just click and um, that type of thing so we were interested in what other kinds of sounds we can get out of it um, I think <laughs> using um, a motor with a very, very small mirror on it, then you can point the laser at it and you can start to um, explore persistence of vision and draw this dot very, very fast in a circle. 
And so you're just seeing one dot, which is drawing, and then if you put the solar panel into that, you get a drone from it. And then if you interfere with the consistency of the light, you start to get a drone with clicks and things like this. You can start to make quite sophisticated glitch music and things like this out of it. I say quite sophisticated, maybe not at all. That sounds like fun, like I like that. Mm -hmm. see some oil drums. Mm -hmm. yeah. Is he in the picture? Is he in the picture? No, only your arm. Only my arm. But it's a great shot. Is that it? So there we have just the, um, a drone, and um, since this video was done, we've worked out ways in which we can control the um, uh, the on-off cycle of the of the laser pen, so we can um, handle that as well. And I think here we've built our. Um, this is a, uh, a tremolo effect. So using some uh, Matthew Deer, I think, passed through a. Uh, <laughs> slipping but you can program that to the obviously just uh, um, just toggle back and forth and then you get essentially a, t um, a homemade tremolo effect using light and solar cells and computer fans and things like this So we developed the, um, the workshop idea as well, rather than just getting people to constantly make what we already knew. Like it, Everybody was interested in this thing that can transmit sound, so everybody wanted to always make this. And we were getting a bit fed up of, of just doing that all the time and not getting anything really out of it. So we, um, we, put, um, we went to Pixel Festival in November last year in Bergen in Norway and um, got a group of people together there to kind of have a workshop about the ideas of the project rather than just making. Of course, there were quite a lot of people there who just wanted to make. And um, so we started to explore um, ways of making the work rather than being what most people would think what we're doing is perhaps DIY, always constantly do it yourself things. We're not interested really in that because we're not doing it ourselves, we're doing it with other people, we're doing it together. So this DIWO, DIT um, methodology really works um, a lot better, but we're trying to get used to that at the moment because we're a bit stuck. It's very difficult to, well, we're finding it very difficult to do the DIWO effectively. How do you choose the people to actually make the work and this type of thing? Um, how do you get the best group of people in the room without excluding some people who are just interested in maybe making the, the simple parts of it or something like that? So um, we're finding this kind of interesting. But out of this came some very, very interesting um, hacks. One was a, uh, um, uh, a tape, uh, a Walkman which had a motor attached to it. It was completely ruined, didn't work. And so we got it going again using a, a computer fan attached to parts of the cogs, and it would wobble a tiny little bit of glass on it. And we got a really nice kind of scratchy, watery sound out of that when it worked. Uh, people were using um, CDs, and we started to explore much more of media. Um, so you get um, the uh, CDs and spin them on fast motors and things like this, and you can ref use that um, to reflect light, so you can actually draw circles with it, but you can also punch holes in them and break the signal up and that type of thing. Um, and we uh, also explored um, uh, using records, so play, pointing the laser pen directly into the vinyl grooves and then picking it up. And it's obviously not as good as putting a record needle on, <laughs> but the idea of like shaky hands kind of trying to get sound out of a record that way um, as a noise performance was very, very interesting and this kind of um, uh, especially if you're using things like tin foil as styluses on record players and things like that, then you get big reflective surfaces, so you start to get shimmer in the room as well of, of the, th the light that you're using and pointing around. Um, and another way which we used, another thing that came out of um, using CDs was um, a workshop in Cairo that we did. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. Which made a very nice sound. It's kind of <coughs> chirpy sound. So just 
three CDs stuck together and flashing a one laser pen into the middle and makes this kind of nice scratchy sound. Had no idea that would happen, but um, it worked very nicely, I think. Um, I still haven't got it to really work in a performance. This was the best instrument that was made in Athens earlier this year, um, which is elastic bands played by mobile phone vibration motors. Um, and then you just put a light source above it, and then you put some solar panels on, um, into the, on the board. And then you can just start to kind of slowly pitch them and change the pitch of them by holding and, s and bending the notes and things like this and ch changing the speed of the motor and stuff like this. And you get some, it's a really, really beautiful drone machine that th th this guy made um, and just out of elastic bands, which um, we tried to use elastic bands before. If you just ping elastic bands, pointing the two parts together, the, uh, the light and the, um, the receiver, it works very nicely, um, but we couldn't really hadn't really built it into an instrument, and this guy took it on, which was um, which is great. And then, so after kind of exploring ways in which we can interfere with things, we uh, um, wanted to, you know to build up control. So the obvious answer for this was at the time to be using Arduino. So um, anybody who's familiar with Arduino's this microprocessor here, which you can program to control motors, control lights on and off, and this blah blah blah. This thing, lots and lots of things that it can do. Um, and it's very cheap, and um, it's in the uh, uh, it's a major part of Floss, the free Libre open source software or, or hardware in this case. Um, so it's kind of um, very good for us. It's completely open, so anybody can make things for it, and so you can make things specifically for transmission and interference um, in Arduino. And um, one nice thing is these LED matrices, which you can scan text on and things like this, and they make. Um, very nice sounds. So uh, this is some text being run. So we start to get rhythms as text scrolls across these. Would work better if I had a video of it. But. Because we were using um, solar cells and having quite a lot of light sources around, um, we thought actually we could power some little noisy devices, things like this, like a 555 timer, which takes absolutely very low amounts of power to actually run. And we can solar power those to make noises. And if we then interfere with those lights and the lights that are creating the power for these are actually ones like the LED matrices, which are kind of um, showing text and things like that, then the power is rising and falling in the same speed and the same rhythms. And, and so um, we discovered this was a very, very um, nice way to be able to go here. There's a, a picture here of the sound that you were just hearing then is, is the, the matrix there is running some text. And at the same time, it's also another solar cell is on it is powering another synthesizer, um, which is uh, made out of tiny little um, integrated circuits, tiny little chips, which just all they do is make noise. They're just noise-making devices. They make a square wave, the, the most basic, and after a while, a bit annoying. But um, you can, by doing this type of thing to them, you get more out of them, I think, uh, than, than what they're um, intended for. And then it started to build up this kind of resonance between all of the machines that we were using. So it wasn't just that we had one thing that it does its thing. It was the fact that they started to feed off of each other. And so this performance built very, very nicely this way. And then uh, finally on to uh, the latest part of the project, which is to um, uh, a, a, a big interest of mine um, uh, since meeting the artist and writer and programmer Martin House a few years ago and kind of through conversations with him, getting in, in very interested in um, steganography, this um, art of secret writing or in um, uh, being able to past messages undetected, which was first done in ancient China with the tattooing of slaves' heads. They'd shave their hair off, and then they would uh, um, tattoo maps or messages onto their heads, let the hair grow back, and then cross them into another town where they're not supposed to go. And to you and to anybody else, they would just look like um, a normal person, um, unless you are the intended recipient of that, and you would know to shave the head of this person and find the message. And um, this kind of... Uh, 
Um, I found interesting in the fact that we were embedding sound into light and it just looks like an LED unless you come up to it and put a solar cell there and suddenly there's music or there's, there's a sound there or something. Um, and to take this kind of idea a bit further, um, especially around the ideas of electromagnetism, these kind of leaking of signals which constantly um, is going on, which was coined um, uh, the phrase tempest by, by NASA, the fact that machines, any machine that has particular electromagnetic pulses um, going through it leaks not just energy and noise and things like that, but actual information inside that. So again, this noise is carrying information. NASA discovered this in the 70s, much to their embarrassment that they were leaking loads and loads of information. You could just pick it up acoustically um, with just a coil of wire. It was very, very simple. Um, and so this kind of, because we're using these open devices, there's loads, there's a lot of noise just naturally occurring in, in the performance, um, stuff that's actually coming out of the speakers, but then stuff which is just happening on the table <laughs> in front of us, and it's just generating a lot of that sort of stuff. And so that kind of seemed like a, an interesting way to, um, to explore the project further. And um, there's various kind of modern uses of steganography inside um, embedding things like a uh, a JPEG inside, or a text document inside a, a JPEG, and you, it just looks like a picture. If you've got like a picture of a cat, it still just looks like a picture of a cat, and all you've done is you've manipulated the the, uh, the noise signal of the image. Um, so you haven't altered to the eye, it looks exactly like a cat, but if you un unpacked it, you'd find um, a particular essay in it or something like that as well, or a picture of a dog or something. Um, and we started to play around with this, and over time, uh, this is an, an image that was uh, of me that was transmitted inside sound. So essentially, there's a sound uh, generated by my face over time, and that's transmitted. And then it, when it's picked up the other side, you can hear that sound. But then if you take it a stage further, there's actually my face is inside that, that image as well. And we're kind of interested in how we can... We haven't managed to get this into a performance properly yet, but that's the next kind of... Um, uh, part of what we want to do. And um, there's kind of things going on at the moment within like intelligent light bulbs, things that light bulbs in your room that send your Twitter feed and this sort of stuff, um, if that's what you want. But um, this, you know, it, it's, it's um, something which I find particularly interesting in the, uh, in the research. And so just to end just like to show a um, like the last part of a performance from Vincent and I. Um, uh, this is a performance that we did in Athens earlier this year. Um, also, yeah, normally we do a performance with the people in the workshop, so we get them to do a performance. Um, uh, so we all do a performance as a big group. However, many people want to do that, so don't force them to do it, obviously. Um, and then afterwards, Vincent and I do something as well. Um, as long as we're better, that's that's all that matters. So I just played the last few moments of the last few minutes of this performance that took place in, place in Athens. Documentation of this sort of stuff is very difficult because it's just constantly we need entire um, blackout because otherwise you get that hum from the lights and things like that. So health and safety wise, it's a it's a, a pain to to perform anywhere, as we found out. But um, just to just to point out that in this performance, um, there's a, a TV monitor over there. And there's uh, LED stuff, there's hack toys and things like this that we're using, and record players, and this is after about 25 minutes or so, um, it's built up quite a, quite a lot of noise.
that's that. Um, there was quite a lot of smelling of burning towards the end of that, um, which we, we could never place, unfortunately. But um, there was no fire. Um, so, um, yeah, this is where the project stuff is. Everything's shared on the site. Um, and we run workshops all the time for people to build these types of things and performances. And if anybody's interested, I can um, show a working kind of transmitter or something. Um, that's it. Thank you very much, David. So, Thanks. do you have any question? No. <laughs> it's too late. <laughs> oh, yeah, sure. Um, don't take my question serious. Um, I like the machines that you that you built, and I agree with you that especially in the beginning, the sound results were not so convincing. Sometimes even a bit poor. But and my question now is, um, when when you came now to more um, to better results concerning music or electronic uh, music. Didn't you just maybe reinvent uh, a very basic synthesizer with maybe some opto-electronic component or so? In many cases, yeah, because, I mean, um, especially when using things like um, 555 timers and things like this, then we're just, that's just a square wave. And so we're constantly working with um, small, you know, the very basic sound sources, which are the building blocks of all synthesis. So. Um, either that or we're working with white noise, and so um, that's the very basic building blocks of all kinds of sound. So it's very difficult to get away from that. But um, yeah, we're, we're, we're not creating anything new, that's for sure. This is just a, a minute <laughs> on, on something. Um, I, I find your work really quite interesting, this is not a criticism of it at all, um, but, um, and, you know, listening into things that are not dead in tune and all the rest, you know, this kind of noise is terribly important, and in fact it led to this, the discovery of the cosmic microwave background, which is one of the most important cosmological discoveries of the 20th century. But at the outset, you mentioned the electronic voice phenomenon, but you didn't make it clear that there's really no evidence whatsoever. Oh, no, I was just... Um, yeah. Yeah. No, I think I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, yeah, I'm not saying yeah. that um, um, right. I'm sceptical yeah. of, of, yeah. of, of EVP in, in, yeah. um, completely. Just but just um, but I was, what I was mentioning there was the writings of Joe Banks about yes. EVP, um, yeah. where he, he um, explains that it's just yeah. actually psychological tests that most of the time that yeah. are being done, rather than yeah. any... But others have worked on it and found nothing, really. Mm. I just have a clarifying question. I, because I didn't really understand where the light came from. Which light? Like when you said you had the iPhone, you had the solar cell, and then you had that little device, and you put on Spotify, mm. and then you were saying, it's the light that produces a sound. How, yeah. how did that work? <laughs> how does it work? Um, very basically. Um, I've got one here I could show. That, um, this has just got an audio connection at one end of a cable. It goes to an audio transformer, which changes the impedance of the signal. And at the other end of it should normally be um, a speaker, or go to mm -hmm. some kind of normal speaker. But here we plugged it into an LED. That's Thank you. basically it. And then it just needs um, some power. Okay. And um, <laughs> then this uh, flashes on and off at the, sp at the, f at the rate of the, uh, um, of the audio, which is just looks like a constant light to us. So that's what <laughs> okay. Thank you very much for your uh, presentation. I have only one question. Uh, there was uh, some months ago, there was a uh, lecture by Helmut Lachemann. Helmut Lachemann is one of the very important composers in Germany. 
And uh, so in his uh, talk, he has uh, mentioned that uh, there is uh, two conditions of noises. It is one, one, one condition, beautiful noise, and the other condition is uh, ugly noise. And uh, my question is, do you have any, uh, any own uh, definition in your work uh, between beautiful noise or and? I think it's beautiful. Um, I th <laughs> because no, uh, I, I, I think... No, uh, <laughs> seriously, I think um, it's yeah. interesting, the language that we use when we're, when we're making it and when we come across something um, like at the beginning, um, as the gentleman said over there, the, the first few sounds which I played through, the very early parts, they're just kind of pops and clicks and it's not really interesting, but they're the building blocks of all the sound which we were interested in eventually getting to. Um, but they were always like, boring and not very exciting. Um, they weren't doing anything to us. And um, what we find, find is that um, actually uh, in the performances, like the one showed from um, um, earlier, um, it's, uh, the noise coupled with the intensity of the volume it becomes a very um, visceral experience on the body um, for, the, uh, for the viewers and for Vincent and myself. And so um, we find this a very moving experience. Um, so um, I'm not sure about beautiful or, or ugly, but it's definitely, um, it does something to us inside, that's for sure. Um. We have one last question, maybe. It's a little late. Just also have the, the comment to your uh, techniques you used. Uh, so basically, if I understood it cor correctly, you um, you invented uh, uh, the optical membrane, or I have not. No, no, I haven't. You, like, I have not invented using, anything. Yeah, yeah. but uh, if you are using the light, which you are focusing on the on the photocell, and uh, then you produce the sound, then you are on the good way to produce some optical membrane and avoid the problems we normally have with the with the membranes in the loudspeakers because we have a lot of uh, technical problems. Uh, and uh, with, the, with the distortion of the signal, etc. And uh, do you have any experiences uh, how the signal is um, distorted afterwards? Have you maybe recorded it to check the frequencies? And no, we've never done any tests on it in, in analysis of that sort. We're not particularly interested in that. But um, I mean, we can distort the signal out of it, so it would eventually distort just like a speaker would. Yeah. Um, and uh, and it, it depends on what component you have receiving. So if you have, there's so many different types of solar cells and so many different types of LDRs and things like that. Some of them work brilliantly, some of them are rubbish. So we have to kind of filter those out. So they, that's like finding a good speaker qu uh, cone or something like that for us. Yeah, but so uh, in any case, uh, I find it is a very good idea in that uh, in technical meaning uh, that we can change maybe the technology, which is more mechanical now, electromechanical, and maybe we can change it to the uh, photo cell. <laughs> I don't think the quality of it is there. I mean, for, for what we're doing is, is fine. And actually, for, we were quite pleased when the LED um, produced music and we could actually understand it. And, and it was actually, it's not really a lot of difference than if we plugged this straight into the, to the mixer and played it through the speakers, which we were quite in, um, interested in. But um, you must remember at the very end of the signal chain, we still we, we have to have some good speakers. So um, mm -hmm. this is always going to be important, I think. Okay, thanks. But yeah, thank you. Um, I also have one uh, question. So first of all, thank you, David. And um, I would like to ask, the light you're using has different colors. Does it play any role that the light has different colors? Yeah, we didn't think so, because we only had green and LEDs for, a first, for a while. Um, we just had lots of those. And then this one here is blue, and we started to get a bit fancy about the kind of look of uh, the project and um, started to th think about that a little bit more but um, we realized that red and green were very different actually. Um, the, the sound is different. Yeah intensity wise which was quite interesting but that's to do with also the solar cell how much red light it picks up how much green light it picks up this mm -hmm. type of thing and you can also get sensors which can you can focus directly in on particular wavelengths of light mm -hmm. um, which we haven't looked into. Um, yeah. But there's potential for maybe for that in terms of the project in the future. So. Okay. Oh, sorry. Um, yes, so I, um, it's the first time that I'm uh, hearing and seeing uh, your work. And uh, so um, I would be interested how you place yourself in the context of electronic music as you seem to, I mean, put a lot of emphasis on performance. So would you say it's more kind of improvisation, so informal points? Uh, 
Is it yeah. about improvisation? It, it, and I mean, what would be your criteria if it was a good improvisation or a not so good one? I mean, so what is, you know, so could you repeat things or will it be always different? Uh, this, so yeah, this what is the structure of this work? So this I is a very good question. <laughs> um, yeah, the, idea, the argument kind of, of whether we would find something nice and then actually be able to replicate it was a big problem for us. Um, but um, we've now found ways in which we can do it because if we use things like Arduino or something like that, then we just program it and it will just do the same thing when we plug it in wherever we perform or whatever. Um, but but it, um, it, it relies very much on improvisation. And um, we, um, if you go to the site, we publish all, push all of the stuff that we're researching in terms of um, other people who are out there have been doing it before we were doing it, way before then. And um, in particular, the work of John Richards, if anybody's um, heard of him, he, he um, uh, runs the group Dirty Electronics and um, runs workshops just like we do. And they do performances and um, he's very interested in the kind of scoring of the performance and things like that, which is something which we were only starting to think about. Um, but having discussed it with him, it's kind of um, now a kind of big part of what we would do, especially when we've done performances with the group because a lot of the time they're just kind of they're I, I, either really, really nervous and don't want to do it at all because they're not in, before they just wanted to turn up, make something and go, um, which is fair enough. Um, or you know, they want to maybe um, just do something over and over and over again. Or, um, that, that it's very difficult for them to do in one day a, a workshop and also think about the performance, but we're, we're needing to kind of build that in um, so that uh, those performances are more interesting. That So far the group performances are fine, but they're not um, they're not doing anything um, brilliant, and it's yeah it's our fault, not not their fault. It's that um, we need to kind of get them to we need to talk through the ideas of performance with them a lot more and the practice of that. Um, what in terms of the good performance? Again, I think that comes back to the earlier question that I responded to is just what it does to us in inside. Um, there's no length of time that we really set ourselves. This was half an hour long, and we just kind of felt, yeah, that's enough. Um, plus, there was a lot of burning, but <laughs> um, we couldn't work out what that was, um, so we thought we'd better stop. But um, the first performance we did was boring for about 20 minutes, and then we suddenly got something and realized where we should go with it, and because people were still in the audience, we carried on for half an hour, and we, we got something good going, but it took us a while to kind of like, yeah, this, is, this was great when we were just doing this to the two of us, but didn't really work, so um, we've certainly learned a lot about that. Does that answer your question? Yes, a little bit. I mean, on some level, I was interested. It, it seems that, I mean, it's not only improvisation in terms of the performance, but also that you improvise the instruments. Oh, so yeah. it's uh, not a kind of fixed instruments on which you can then do some improvisations. So on some level, it seems that you, at the same time, improvise instruments as, as sound. Well, we have to improvise the whole way through, like... Yes, um, and so on some level the question is really um, at which point uh, um, leads it to an implosion of the idea of improvisation? Sorry? Which, uh, at which point it can lead to an implosion of the idea of improvisation that finally, I mean, on some level has a set point from where it starts and you try to, I mean, dynamize all ingredients, so to say. Sorry, I lost, missed the last bit. So, and, and I you think an, an, your concept is to dynamize all parts of the performance that in the end should produce sound. And uh, so the question is if this is possible. Um, I'm not sure if it's possible, but um, what we're hoping to just explore in improvisation is that it's not just in the performance and that it is um, at the very start of the day, there may be somebody in the group who we've never met before who, m who makes something out of elastic bands or something that is an instrument that we've had no experience with and then suddenly we have to perform with that that evening in front of a, an audience. And so um, this improvisation the r right the way through and it never gets in the way of, it, it pushes the project constantly. So it's not, we never feel that it's, um, uh, interfering with the project in a negative way, but um, I'm not sure if it ever m makes a level where uh, it implodes in improvisation. I'm not sure. <laughs> okay.
Thank you very much, David. Thank you. And